My name is Tim Chafee, and we're going to be talking about the most important events that have ever occurred on this planet, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm the content manager for the Attractions Division at Answers in Genesis. Uh, that means I have the unique privilege to work with our incredible design team as we develop exhibits at the Creation Museum and at the Ark Encounter, and I have the uh, the privilege of uh, heading up the content for those. So the signs that you read when you walk through there, uh, either I wrote those or oversaw the writing of those and relied on our experts in, in various areas to develop that content. I love what I get to do, and then I get to come out and, and talk about my favorite subject to talk about, and that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in this presentation, what we, we're going to do is look at the importance of the resurrection, and we're also going to look at some of the... Uh, the claims that people have made over the last uh, 2,000 years, trying to explain away the evidence for the resurrection. But, and we're going to look at some of the, resurrec the evidence for the resurrection as well. So we're going to go through that uh, over the, the course of the next hour. But before we do, I've got to tell you about this man who traveled to Israel. And he and his wife went there, and, and her mother, so his mother-in-law came along as well. And they were going through all these different historical places, just having a wonderful time there, uh, and just, uh, just learning so much rich history. But tragically, one night... While they were in the hotel, the mother-in-law passed away in her sleep. And they didn't know what to do. I mean, you're, you're in a foreign country, and they're wondering, you know, how, how can we handle this? So they talked to the funeral home director, and he said, you know, you've got a couple of options here. We can take care of everything here, prepare the body, send her back to the United States, but it's going to cost a lot of money, you know, for preparation for, you know, shipping, customs, everything like that. So it's going to cost a lot of money. Uh, but the other option is she can have the honor of being buried right here in this land, in the land of Israel, in the Holy Land, where there's so much rich history and everything. And the guy thought about it for a second. He said, you know, I heard about this guy once. They buried him here, and he came back to life, and I just can't take that chance. I'm kidding. I don't have a problem with mothers-in-law. My wife has a great one. And so does my son-in-law, for the record. For he was the greatest leader of all people, of all time. He was the Lord of the new humanity. He was the Savior of the world. Those words were written about. You would think Jesus Christ. No, actually they're written in memory of Vladimir Lenin, the murderous, brutal dictator who slaughtered millions of his own people. In fact, you can visit Moscow and you can go to Red Square and you can go right there to his tomb and you can stand behind hundreds of school children waiting to get in and you can, once you finally get in, you can see his body lying in state and next to that, or you know, it, keeps them, it costs them a lot of money every year to keep that updated and make, it, make sure it looks presentable, you can see that sign. But take a look at the wording. He was, he was, he was. Everything's past tense. What if we were to change those to present tense? For he is the greatest leader of all people of all time. He is the Lord of the new humanity, and we'll use that in a very different way than what they would. He is the Savior of the world. Now who are we talking about? Now we would be talking about Jesus Christ. Why can we speak of him in, with the present tense? Because he is alive, because he conquered death. The resurrection is central to the Christian faith. In fact, in, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul said, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. So how important is the resurrection of the Christian faith? Well, just a few things in this passage. If Jesus did not rise, our preaching is empty. Our faith is empty. We are false witnesses, and we are still in our sins. Why? Because Jesus said he's going to rise from the dead, and if he didn't rise from the dead, that would make him a liar, meaning he could not die on the cross for our sins. He would be dying for his own sin, and we would have no salvation, meaning we would suffer for our own sins eternally. There would be no forgiveness. The dead are gone. We would never see our loved ones again, and we are to be pitied more than anyone because we're living our lives according to a standard that is based on a lie. If Jesus did not rise. So how important is the resurrection? It's everything to the Christian faith. Without it, there is no Christianity. In fact, Paul said it's part of the gospel message. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 
Did you notice the content of the gospel message? I'm not saying, you know, how we should respond to that. I'm not saying all the implications of that. I'm saying the content of the message that was preached, the sacrificial death of Christ, the burial, and his resurrection. That's the content of the gospel message. And sadly, too often, people forget to mention the resurrection when attempting to share the gospel. Now, of course, God can still use our shortcomings and everything, but let's make sure as we share the gospel with others, we are telling them the good news. It's not just that Jesus died for our sins. That is great news, but it's also that he conquered death and he'll raise us as well. We can have life in his name. The resurrection was prophesied both in the Old Testament and also in the New. Jesus himself said that he would rise from the dead. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said to them, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. You're going to raise it up in three days? Well, John tells us that Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. Now you might say, well, that's a little bit vague. You know, Jesus said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it. Can you really believe that he was talking about his body? Well, I do because the Bible tells us that's what he was. And in fact, later on at one of his trials, this is what somebody said against him, that he would tear down the temple and raise it up in three days. So they believed that. But Jesus also made it very clear in other statements. How about this one in Matthew chapter 20? Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. Is that vague? No, that's like a play-by-play account of everything that's going to happen, and that's exactly what did happen. Jesus knew what was going to happen, and he told his disciples what was going to happen. In fact, what did Jesus say would be the sign that he would give the unbelieving world? You know, when some of the scribes and Pharisees said to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. What did Jesus say? Did he say, uh, an evil and adulterous generation seek after a sign, and no sign will be given to it, right? Period, end of sentence. Or maybe we should keep on reading because what's the rest of it say? Except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Why is Jesus going to be in the grave only for three days and three nights? Because he's going to rise from the dead. He says, the sign I will give to this evil and adulterous generation is the resurrection. So not only is it central to our faith, it's also the sign Jesus said he's going to give to this world. That he really is who he claimed to be. The Bible tells us that Jesus presented himself alive or showed himself alive by many infallible proofs after he rose from the dead. Luke tells us that in Acts 1-3. He presented himself alive by many infallible proofs. What is an infallible proof? Well, that's a proof that is not fallible. It's a proof that cannot be overcome. It's it's undeniably true. I mean, that it happened. What would it take to convince you that somebody you knew before that the, and you knew that they had died, what would it take to convince you that they were alive again? What would be an infallible proof for you that that person was alive again? Maybe seeing them, but not really far away in the distance. You've got to see them close up to make sure it's really them, right? How about eating with them or drinking with them? Watch them drink something. Or how about um, you touch them? Okay, you listen to them talk. You, you learn from them. You know what? That's what Jesus did in, all, in those post-resurrection appearances, the Gospels record all of those things. He ate with them. He drank with them. He, you know, people hung on to him. Uh, they, they walked with him. They talked with him. They saw him. All those things to demonstrate that this wasn't just some phantom. This wasn't a ghost. This is Jesus raised from the dead, and there he is. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, a passage we were looking at earlier, says that, Jesus was seen by Cephas. This is a a name for Peter. And then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained of the present, but some have fallen asleep. What's he saying? Look, more than 500 people saw him alive at the same time. And most of them are still alive. So if you don't believe me, track down one of these people. They'll tell you. After that, he was seen by James then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. The Gospels are unanimous that Jesus rose from the dead. We should expect this, but this is how each of the Gospels ends. The the last chapter in each Gospel and then the last two chapters in John's Gospel, all about the post-resurrection appearances. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said, Matthew 28, 6. In Mark, he is risen, he is not here. In Luke 24, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. 
And then in the Gospel of John, he says, this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he had, was raised from the dead. So each of the Gospels hinge on whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. If he, did, if he didn't, we can say that the Gospels are not reliable. But it's not just the Gospels. In fact, it's the entire New Testament, and also the Old Testament, because the Old Testament prophesied that he would rise, that he'd be in the grave just for a short time, and that he would live again after his death. But the whole New Testament focuses on the resurrection. In fact, I would challenge you, the next time you read through the New Testament, especially from Acts onward, every time you see something about Jesus being raised from the dead, or that he's risen, or the resurrection, anything about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, underline it or highlight it, you're going to be stunned at how frequently it appears. It is all over the place. In fact, there's times where it seems like Paul can't even write a sentence about Jesus without saying, oh, whom God raised from the dead. It's all over the place. It was always on the forefront of their mind. In fact, in the book of Acts, every single time there's a sermon recorded given by one of the apostles, the central focus of that message, every time without fail, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, a, a chapter we've already been looking at, 58 verses all about the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that means for us in the future. Those who are believers, we're also going to be raised bodily. This mortal body will put on immortality. This corruptible body will put on incorruptibility because of what Jesus has done. First Thessalonians tells us this is, that it's a reason for comfort and hope. Those who have, who have died before, if they were believers, and we are, we're going to get to see them again. We don't grieve like those who have no hope. In Romans, he says that, if, that because God raised Jesus up, he's also going to give life to our mortal bodies. We're also going to be raised if we believe in him. Hebrews only mentions the resurrection specifically one time. But the whole book is about how he is our great high priest who is always at the right hand of God, who is interceding for us. Well, how can he be doing that if he was still in the grave? So the whole book is contingent upon Jesus being raised from the dead. And in the book of Revelation, two different times, Jesus refers to himself as the one who had lived and then had died and then was alive forevermore. He refers to himself as the resurrected one. It's all over the place in the New Testament. So let's look at some of the evidence we have for this event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. One of the, the strongest ones is, is found in the, the lives of the disciples after the event. What happened to the disciples the night that Jesus was arrested? Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, they fled. They ran away in fear, and that's understandable. We probably would too if we were there. All except for John, who, who stayed pretty close to the proceedings, and Peter, who tried to stay pretty close. And we'll talk about Peter in just a little bit. But these men went from running away in fear, being a bunch of cowards that night, to being willing to give their lives for this belief that Jesus died on the cross and then rose from the dead. And wherever they went, that's what they were proclaiming. It didn't matter what people did to them. And there are a lot of times that uh, Christians will try to defend the resurrection and they'll say something like this. Uh, well, nobody would die for a lie. And that's not quite the, the right way to say it because you know what? People will die for a lie. In fact, a lot of people have died for a lie. Think back, uh, it's almost 20 years now, it's hard to believe, but uh, September 11, 2001, when those hijackers took over those planes and flew them into buildings, and uh, th those hijackers died for a lie. And people would look at the disciples and say, well, these people, you know, they're... They're willing, they're, they would just die for a lie as well. But here's, here's a huge difference. In fact, there's two huge differences here between what the disciples were willing to do and what those terrorists did on September, September 11th. One, those, those terrorists were trying to take as many people with them as they could. They were trying to kill as many people as possible. The disciples, out of love and out of gratitude for what Christ had done for them, went wherever they could to tell people that they could be forgiven and that they could have eternal life through belief in Jesus Christ, through faith in Christ. And it didn't matter what you did to them. So they were willing to suffer loss of limb or to die for that proclamation. That's very different than the motivation of those hijackers. And there's another huge difference that we have to understand here. The disciples were in a position to know whether or not their beliefs were true. You see, what we really need to say is people will not die for what they know to be a lie. Okay, the disciples knew whether or not their beliefs were true. They knew, did we really see Jesus alive from the dead again? And every single one of them, 
as far as church history tells us, who's willing to go to their graves, who's willing to be uh, martyred, except for John, who apparently was not, um, were, they were willing to be martyred for that belief. James, the brother of John, Acts 12, tells us he was killed by Herod with the sword. Church tradition tells us that the others were crucified, stoned, impaled, flayed, which means skinned alive, beheaded or hung upside down by iron hooks through the ankles. Let me ask you a question. If you were one of these disciples, and this was something that you made up, the whole idea of the resurrection, if it was just made up, as a lot of skeptics say, that these early church leaders got together because they say for fame or for power or for money, whatever it was, which none of those things were there for them. At that point, all it was was just persecution and death and ridicule, mockery, wherever they went. And it also meant loss of family, loss of jobs, all those things they were willing to give up for this belief. But if you were making this up and they said, okay, we're going to uh, behead you, don't you think at some point you would kind of spill the beans and say, hey guys, I'd rather not have that happen. We made the whole thing up. And every single one of them was willing to endure persecution and death for their belief because they knew Jesus had died on the cross and then he rose from the dead. Coward, they went from cowards to martyrs. Liars don't make good martyrs. How about Simon Peter? We mentioned him a little bit ago. He went from, remember being so bold where the night Jesus was arrested, he pulled out a sword and he tries to hack at the guy who, one of the guys trying to arrest Jesus ends up hacking off his ear. And he probably wasn't just going for the ear. He's probably going for the whole head. And then Jesus heals the man. But that same guy, Peter, who when he's next to Jesus is so bold and brave and even told Jesus earlier that day, I'll never deny you. And Jesus says, no, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Before the next morning, you're going to deny me three times. And then Peter tries to follow the procession. He tries to follow what's going on with Jesus. And when he goes through this doorway, there's a servant girl and she says, you're one of his followers, aren't you? Oh, no, not me. What are you talking about? There's one. Then he sees people warming themselves by the fire and they're like, yeah, we recognize your accent. You're one of his followers. No, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. Somebody else says, yeah, you're one of his followers. And it says that he called down curses on them and, said, and said, I don't know the man. And then the rooster crowed, just like Jesus said it would. And Peter ran away in shame because he had just denied Jesus three times, even though he had promised earlier that night that he never would do that. And yet, where do we find Peter seven weeks later? He stands up on the day of Pentecost in front of thousands of his fellow Jews and gives the least seeker-sensitive message of all time. Well, think about it. What do I mean by that? The, the Jews had been looking forward to their Messiah for centuries. And Peter stands up and says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death. And he goes on for the next eight verses or so, talking about the resurrection and how it was prophesied in the Old Testament. But he says that we've been waiting for our Messiah, but guess what? He just came and you just killed him. Can you imagine how bold Peter had to be to make those claims? Because he had to have known at any point the crowd could have turned on him and stoned him or, or led him away to be crucified, whatever it was. The guy who was afraid to confess Jesus to a servant girl suddenly is bold enough to do this? What happened? Well, the Bible tells us they were filled with the Holy Spirit and Peter knew Jesus had died and he saw him alive again. And there was nothing that was going to prevent him from proclaiming that truth. In fact, the existence of the church today is a great testament to the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because where did it begin? Well, I just talked about it on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem when Peter stands up and gives that message and 3,000 people believed that day. But if Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, if his body was still there in the tomb, anybody in that crowd could have said, hey, Peter, you're talking about Jesus being raised from the dead? Come here. Let's take a little walk down here. Let's go outside the city and see that, that tomb right there. Let's roll away the stone. We got enough people to do this. There's Jesus. Now sit down and stop filling the city with your lies. But nobody could do that. Why? Because his body wasn't in the tomb because he rose from the dead on the third day, just like he said he would. The enemies could have easily produced the body, but they didn't. The church was founded on belief in the risen Savior. In fact, the one place Christianity should not have ever been able to start if it was fake is Jerusalem itself. And yet that's the very place where it started. There is no hope and no salvation in our message without the resurrection. 
So the fact that the church exists today is a great testament to the reality of the resurrection. And sometimes skeptics will say, well, you know what, Jesus only appeared to his own followers. And sometimes I've heard Christians say that too, and I thought, no, that's not true. Now, most of the people he appeared to were his followers, but not all of them. How about this guy, James, the half-brother of Jesus? He's the son of Mary and Joseph. It tells us that he rejected Christ prior to the crucifixion. In John 7, 5, it says, for even his brothers did not believe in him. And in Mark chapter 3, it goes even further. It says that his family tried to prevent him from speaking and said that he was out of his mind. Can you imagine having those words written about you in Scripture, saying that Jesus was out of his mind? But this is what his family is saying. And when Jesus is on the cross, who does he entrust the care of his mother to? Not to one of his siblings, but to John, who was one of his disciples. Because his brothers didn't believe at that point. But think about it for a minute. It would be kind of tough if you were one of his brothers, right? If suddenly Jesus goes out and says, I'm the Son of God. I'm the Messiah. That would be difficult to take, wouldn't it? But don't you think that one of those guys, one of his, his half-brothers, don't you think they could have said, hey, Mom, you hear what Jesus is saying? Is there anything to this? Don't you think she could have sat them down and said, hey, let me tell you about what happened before he was born, how this angel came and visited me, and uh, before your dad and I were ever together, all of these things. Don't you think she could have set the record straight? But again, that would still be tough to take if you were, if you were one of his half-brothers. But before the day of Pentecost, we find James in the upper room with the rest of the disciples. Something had happened to him. And in, the, and in Galatians chapter 2, one of the earliest books in the New Testament to be written, he's called a pillar of the church. In Acts chapter 15, at what's called the Jerusalem Council, where you get all these church leaders together, you've got Peter and Paul, you've got some of the biggest names there. Who's the guy who kind of stands up and takes charge at the end? This is James. And then, according to three different historians, he died a martyr's death. And there's a little bit of disagreement about how he died. One of them says that he was thrown off the temple top. The other one says that he was beaten to death. And the third one says, no, actually, both things are true. He was thrown off the temple, but he, it didn't kill him. It just broke his legs. And he got to his knees and was praying for the mob that had done that to him. And somebody came up and beat him to death with a club. What happened to James? Somebody who did not believe in Jesus prior to Christ's death. And then suddenly, within seven weeks, he's a believer to the point that he's willing to die a martyr's death. Well, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us after that he was seen by James. So Jesus appeared to him, and James knew that, you know what? My half-brother really is who he claimed to be. And he went around proclaiming that. How about this guy? Maybe Saul of Tarsus you might have heard of, or we might know him as the Apostle Paul. He went from being the church's greatest persecutor to, I think, the greatest Christian who's ever lived. Now, some people want to debate that, but if you want to, find somebody else who wrote 13 books of the New Testament and we'll talk. Now, consider this. Here's a guy who in Acts 9.1, it says he was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. In Acts 22, he says, I persecuted this way to the death. The way is an early name for the church. He persecuted them to the death. Paul put Christians to death. He says in Acts 26.10, And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue, and I compelled them to blaspheme. This is not a nice guy. This is somebody who is so zealous for his faith that he's willing to put Christians to death because he thinks that they're blaspheming by claiming that Jesus Christ is God that Jesus is, is the Christ and that he's God. And so here he is trying to put Christians to death and he's on his way to Damascus to do some more, uh, you know, to throw more Christians in jail. And I like to say that he saw the light because Jesus appeared to him and Paul's life did a complete 180. He went from persecuting the church as much as he could to living every moment to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. In fact, in 2 Corinthians, and he still had several years of ministry after this, he wrote this about some of the trials that he endured for the sake of Christ. He said he was in labors more abundant, in prisons more frequently, five times he had received 40 stripes minus one. If you've seen the movie The Passion of the Christ, you know what flogging is because you'll never forget it if you've watched that movie. I'm not saying that you have to go and watch it. It's, it's, it's very difficult to see. It's very graphic, very gory. Um, I think it's important for us to understand the what, what Jesus endured for us and uh, some of the, the physical torment that he endured. Of course, no mo movie could ever capture 
the uh, emotional or the spiritual torment that he went through as well. Uh, you know, he's completely innocent, and yet he's getting all the sins of the world laid on him. But this movie does a pretty powerful job of showing the physical beatings that went, he went through. And that flogging scene, you'll remember, Paul got that five times. Can you even imagine? It's hard to even imagine being struck by that one time. And yet Paul got 39 stripes five different times. Three times he was beaten by rods. He was stoned once, left for dead. He was shipwrecked. And again, still many more years of, of a service after this. How many more trials did he endure for the sake of Christ? Why would he go through that? I mean, can you imagine being Paul's traveling companion? You go into a town, let's say you're Timothy or Silas or Barnabas. You go into a town and you start preaching in the synagogues. And for the first couple of weeks, it's, it's going okay. Okay, you're, getting some, you're convincing some people, persuading them that Jesus really is the promised Messiah. And yet most people aren't having it. Pretty soon they throw you out of the synagogue, so you go to the Gentiles. And that was his custom. And we're told in Acts 17 and Acts 18. And so you go to the Gentiles and, and you start leading a few people to the Lord. And pretty soon the people who rejected you before come along and they start this uprising. And they cause this riot or whatever. They take you outside the city and they stone you, leave you for dead. And then a few hours later, you kind of come to your senses. You look at Timothy or who's ever there with you and say, hey, let's go to the next town and do it again. <laughs> that was Paul's life. Why? Well, he tells us actually in Philippians chapter 3. He says this, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, that I may know him and the power of his, what's that word right there? his resurrection, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. I saw Jesus alive and I cannot wait to see him again. So do whatever you want to me because if you kill me, that's the best thing that can happen. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He couldn't wait to be back with his Lord. And that was Paul's life. What happened to this guy who wanted to, to wipe out Christianity and suddenly wanted to share it with every single person? He met the risen Lord. There is no other explanation that makes sense. So Paul's life is a power test, powerful testament to the resurrection. And how about the straightforward reporting that we get in the Gospels? You know, a lot of times the skeptics will say things like, well, these guys were just, you know, it's written hundreds of years later or many, many decades later after these, this legendary development, and yet we don't have anything like that in the Gospels. Uh, you know, you do see that in the Gospel of Peter. And some of you might be flipping through your Bibles right now like, Gospel of Peter, where is that? Well, you don't have it in your, in your Bible. And that's a good thing. It wasn't written by Peter. Okay, this is something that came along at least 100 years later. And here's what it says. On that first Easter morning, that first resurrection morning, so the, the two angels come down, they roll away the stone, they go into the tomb. That's so far so good, right? And then they come out of the tomb and Jesus is following them. And their heads stretch all the way up into the clouds. Jesus' head stretches up even higher than the angels. And then the cross comes out of the tomb and a voice booms from heaven and says, have you proclaimed the message to those who sleep? And the cross says, yes. That is legendary development. That is embellishment. That's the kind of stuff you get after hundreds of years. The gospels know nothing of that. It's just straightforward reporting. In fact, they tell us things that... that really aren't all that helpful if you think about it. If you're trying to, if you're making this up, okay, if you're the early disciples and you're trying to make up this, this religious belief, which is what a lot of people accuse them of doing, if you're saying, we gotta, we gotta make up this whole idea of the resurrection, oh, I know, who gets to see him first? You know, again, if you're making it up, who gets to see him first? Peter, he's like one of, the, one of the leading disciples, maybe John, or wait, if you're making it up, why not Pilate? Or better yet, the high priest? No, no, no. People could check that out right away because you're in Jerusalem. I know. How about Rome? How about Caesar? I mean, again, you're making it up. Nobody's going to be able to check on that. They didn't have cell phones at the time to call right away. Hey, did Jesus appear to Caesar? See, they don't have that. So why not make something up like that? Who did they choose? Who is the first person that gets to see Jesus? What do the Gospels tell us? Mary Magdalene. The last person on earth you would ever pick if you were making this up. Why? Well, first of all, she's a woman. Sorry, ladies. But at that time, a woman's testimony was not considered valid in that culture. So you wouldn't pick a woman if you were making it up. And let alone, you would never pick a woman that Jesus cast seven demons out of. She is the least likely person to have picked. So why do the Gospels tell us that Mary Magdalene was the first to see him? Because she was. There's no other explanation for that. 
And by the way, it also includes other details like that, that seem to disagree at first, but as you put everything together, you see that they fit together nicely. Like how many women went to the tomb that morning? If you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, they all mention different numbers. Now, none of them are saying there were only three, and that's all the people that went to the tomb. If anybody says there were more than that or less than that, they're lying. They don't say that. They just mention, so Matthew, Mark uh, mentioned three. Luke mentions, names three, and then says, and the other women. So there's at least five that went to the tomb that morning. And John really only speaks about Mary Magdalene, but when she goes to the tomb and sees that the stone is rolled away, she takes off and reports to Peter and John and says, they've taken away the body of our Lord and we don't know where they've laid him. So she acknowledges that there was more than one that went to the tomb. The Gospels are actually uh, in harmony on that, just as they are in other things. But a lot of times people will point to those things and say, well, you can't trust the Bible because of these, these so-called contradictions. Well, that's not a contradiction. Actually, they fit together just fine. If they were in collusion... If these guys are making up their stories, they're going to get together and say, let's make sure we all say the same thing. But they weren't doing that because they're just giving you the reports, either eyewitness reports for some of them and the other ones, the things that they learned from the eyewitnesses. And how about the empty tomb as evidence for the resurrection? Any theory that is proposed to deny the resurrection must account for the empty tomb. Even Christ's enemies at that time admitted the tomb was empty which is a pretty strong argument when it comes to historical studies. It's one thing if you, tell, if you say something about yourself or people who are loyal to you say something about you. It's an, entirely, it's an entirely different thing if your enemy says those same things about you. And in this case, they're admitting the tomb was empty because they're trying to come up with an explanation to say how the tomb was empty. And we'll look at that one at the end of our time here this morning or, I'm sorry, or this afternoon, wherever you happen to be. Uh, and this... Empty tomb separates Jesus from everyone else, every other religious leader that has ever been. They don't make the claim that they're going to rise from the dead. Why? Because they don't have the power to rise from the dead. They died and they stayed there. But we have other evidences as well. Some people will say, well, so far everything you've told me is just right out of the Bible. I don't believe the Bible. Well, so what? I, I do, and the Bible is the word of God. So if it tells us that Jesus rose from the dead, he rose from the dead. Okay? But... We can look at things that are not necessarily from the Bible that are consistent with the Bible. Now, the first one I understand, this is uh, very subjective. I'm not expecting anybody, uh, you know, if you're not a believer, if you're watching this, I'm not expecting anybody to say, okay, I'm going to believe now because Tim says that he knows Jesus is alive. Um, you know, when I was a, a kid, I used to go to one of those little country churches where we had a, a board up on the side where it showed the, the numbers for the hymns that we were going to sing that day. And I always looked forward to a certain number for the song He Lives. Even as a young kid, my favorite subject was the resurrection. I loved singing about it. I'm not going to sing the song for you today because I want you to stick around till the, for the rest of the talk. But at the end of that, uh, at the, uh, the, the chorus, it says, you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Now that might sound really strange for an unbeliever. But if you're somebody who's been walking with the Lord for many years, do you know what that means? Yeah, you know exactly what that means. And we know beyond any shadow of a doubt that he's alive because of the change that he's been making within us. But again, it's, that's, I understand that's very subjective, um, but it's strong evidence for me and for other believers who have experienced the same thing. They know that Christ is alive. How about the testimony of these former skeptics and atheists, C.S. Lewis, Josh McDowell, Lee Strobel, you might have heard of these guys. They set out to try to disprove the resurrection to show that it didn't happen. And they became believers. In fact, I've got uh, several people that I'm close to that I've debated before on, other, on different topics. In fact, they'd like to argue with me about creation, evolution, and the age of the earth, those things that, that we talk about a lot here at, at Answers in Genesis or the flood. They like to argue about those things. And then I'll just say, hey, can you disprove the resurrection of Jesus for me? Because let's, let's go to what it's really all about. And they don't touch it. And I know why. And I think they know why too. Because we have this really cool title that we give to a lot of atheists who set out to try to disprove the resurrection. A lot of times we call them Christians now. And for many people, they don't want to believe. So they're not going to study that aspect of it. We also have something called the Nazareth inscription, which is this marble tablet that was, is claimed to have been found in Nazareth in the 1870s. Now, it's a rescript, which means it's like a, a, a summary of a law passed by Emperor Claudius in the 40s, not the 1940s, the 40s. So within 10 to 20 years of the crucifixion and the resurrection, there is a law coming from the emperor that prescribes capital punishment for anybody who would move a body from a tomb with wicked intent. There's no 
mention of typical grave robbing, you know, because grave robbers didn't steal the bodies, they stole the valuables buried with the bodies. And it specifically mentions sepulchre sealing stones, which are only found in Israel. So what happened in the empire 10 to 20 years before this, or close to this time, that would cause the emperor himself to pass a law forbidding anybody to move a body from a tomb with what they called wicked intent. Well, think about what was happening as the apostles went throughout the empire and they're proclaiming that Jesus rose from the dead. And then you have other people coming along, especially some of the Jewish people at that time, saying, no, 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 the disciples stole the body. And then you get this, this riot that occurs or like what happened with Paul in a few places. And Rome wanted peace, so you can't have people stirring up trouble and turmoil in the empire and say, look, this is all about a dead body that was allegedly moved. That's what the Jewish leaders are saying. So here's a law. Nobody can move a body from a tomb with wicked intent. So here we have what it seems like archaeological evidence that is perfectly consistent with the resurrection. Now, actually, in the news in just the last couple of weeks, there's been... Um, some news about the Nazareth inscription. Some people said, no, 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 this is not about Jesus at all. This is about a, a, a king from, a, from one of these islands nearby. And um, so but there, there's some problems with the argumentation in uh, the study that was made. One, there's no sepulcher ceiling stones in, in that place. And also, they say it was passed by Augustus, so several decades earlier. And yet, why would the person that, whose tomb was desecrated, that this is supposedly in reference to, uh, from, this, from this new study. Um, why would it, that was an enemy of Augustus. Why would he care if his enemy's tomb was desecrated? Okay, so there's a couple of flaws in the argumentation there. Um, but there's still some question about it. That's why archaeology, these kind of things, we still have to make some interpretations. It's not always the best evidence that some people think it is. But here we have, seem to have something that is perfectly consistent with the biblical record. Again, we don't need these extra things. The Bible tells us, and because it's the Word of God, we can believe that we, we can have complete confidence that it's true. Then we also have these five key evidences, or what Dr. Gary Habermas calls the five minimal facts. So what he's done over 40 plus years now, Dr. Habermas has been compiling all of the different journal articles from law journals, medical journals, scientific journals, theological journals, and it doesn't matter if you're a conservative or, or very liberal end of the spectrum as far as theology goes. Uh, do, it doesn't matter uh, what your background is. If you're able to get published in those journals and you're writing about the crucifixion or resurrection, what are the details that, that people agree on? And he said the vast majority of them, in fact, way over 95%, is that Jesus died by crucifixion. I think it's 99%. Jesus died by crucifixion. So all the people saying Jesus didn't even live or he was, you know, all these, that he was copied from pagan gods as we looked at in a previous session, um, that you know, there's, there's no basis for that among historical scholars. There's no basis for that for the people who are doing the research on this. Uh, number two, the disciples were convinced that they had seen Jesus risen from the dead and they boldly proclaimed that as true. Notice the skeptics aren't saying that Jesus did rise from the dead, just that the disciples not just the skeptics, but all the scholars here that, are, that have been compiled, are saying that, that the disciples were at least convinced they saw Jesus risen from the dead, that Paul converted because he believed he had seen Jesus, that James converted for the same reason, and the tomb was empty. So do these five key evidences, do they prove that Jesus rose from the dead? No. Again, we have scripture to tell us that he did. We can have complete confidence in that. But here's what these five evidences do. They provide a nice little checklist for us as we go through all of these alternative theories to see if they can even match the historical details that scholars are admitting are true. So here's what you'll find is that with these alternative theories, some of them will try to explain how people saw him alive again. And other ones will try to explain how the tomb became empty, but they don't have anything that explains both. And yet you need both explanations, and they can't give you one. So let's take a look at some of these alternative theories. And I wish we had more time to get into a lot of detail with each of those. Uh, but for the first one, we've got this case of mistaken identity. This is the Islamic view. And this idea states that uh, Jesus was, shortly before his arrest, he was taken up to heaven because, according to their theology, God would never allow one of his prophets to suffer like that. Well, maybe they should read the Old Testament. God allowed his prophets to suffer quite a bit. Uh, the New Testament tells us that Jesus suffered tremendously and that many of the apostles did as well. But he was taken up to heaven before the arrest, and one of his disciples, probably Judas, was transformed to look just like him. And then he's the one who got taken to the cross. Here's what it says in the Quran. 
that they say and boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. For of a surety they killed him not, nay, Allah raised him up to himself. Now there are some problems with several statements in here. First of all, he's talking about Jewish people boasting that they had killed Christ Jesus. Would a Jewish person who didn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah ever claim that they killed Christ Jesus? Would they ever boast about that? No. Why? Because Christ and Messiah mean the same thing. Anointed one. Uh, Christ is from Christus, the the Greek, and and Messiah is Mashiach in, in the Hebrew. It means the same thing, the anointed one. And if they did believe that Jesus was the Christ, they certainly wouldn't boast about killing him. They would feel shame for what they had done, just as we should the fact that our sin is what leads to Jesus being on the cross. And by the way, Jews would never say the messenger of Allah. And how about this? The whole idea is that Allah is just this deceiver who makes people think that Judas is Jesus when he's really not. He's just transformed. This poor guy goes out to be crucified in Jesus' place. It's all about deception. And it denies the fact that we already looked at that Jesus was crucified. But... It's not just the Quran that talks about that. They also have the gospel of Barnabas. Does this concern you? I mean, Barnabas is called an apostle in the book of Acts. He's the son of encouragement. He's the one who sells a field and gives the proceeds to the church. He travels with Paul. Here's what it says. Judas entered impetuously before all into the chamber whence Jesus had been, had been taken up and the disciples were sleeping. Whereupon the wonderful God acted wonderfully insomuch that Judas was changed in speech and in face to be like Jesus that we believed him to be Jesus. And as he was saying this, the soldiery entered and laid their hands upon Judas because he was in every way like unto Jesus. So the gospel of Barnabas has this. Should we be concerned No, because the Gospel of Barnabas was not written by Barnabas. Now, there is an early church document called the Epistle of Barnabas, but the Gospel of Barnabas is a 16th or 17th century forgery that was written in order to try to bolster the Islamic view of what happened. In fact, when it quotes from the Bible, it quotes the Latin Vulgate, which was translated by Jerome around 400 AD. So I, don't, I think you know how this works. If you're quoting something, that means it was written before you. So if you're quoting the Latin Vulgate, that means you were written after that translation was done. And it quotes the Italian poet Dante, who lived in around 1300. So that means it was written after that. It calls Jesus the Christ and Muhammad the Messiah. The same sort of confusion that you see with the Quran. And I think confusion that you see with people today, I think a lot of people think that Christ is Jesus' last name. It's not. It's a title that means anointed one. It has abundant geographical and historical errors. It says that they reached Nazareth by boat. Well, I've been to Nazareth before. I'd love to go back to Israel and everything, but there's no way they could reach Nazareth unless the Sea of Galilee had flooded by over 2,000 feet at that time. It says Pilate was the governor at Christ's birth. No, he was the governor at Christ's death. It says Barnabas was one of the 12. No, he wasn't. He was called an apostle in Acts, but he wasn't one of the 12. There are other people who try to deny history in other ways. Well, they'll, they'll just really avoid the issue of the, the resurrection altogether by saying, well, there's contradictions in certain places here in the Bible, in the, in the Gospels, like they don't fit together just right. Well, one, I don't believe there are contradictions. I think that we can reconcile all of those difficulties. In fact, I have a whole talk that I give just on these supposed Bible contradictions, and we've got a couple of resources dealing with those as well. But how would, even if you were able to find, which you won't be able to, but let's say you could find one little contradiction about how something is reported, would that, dis- would that disprove the whole message, the main point that everybody agrees on, that Jesus rose from the dead? You see, really they're just trying to avoid the issue by trying to nitpick about certain things that actually can be reconciled. Or you have the Christ myth, people claiming that Jesus never existed or he was copied from these pagan gods. You've got the legend view where there was a, the Christians, um, they had this, this guy who was a pretty good teacher and they just kind of embellished the stories as time went on and eventually became, you know, to the point where they were considering him to be God. Um, the Jesus family tomb, that's an idea that was pro- promoted back in uh, 2007, I believe it was, uh, in, a, in a book and a, a a video called the Jesus Family Tomb. Um, I wish I had time to get into each of these, but these are each of these cases are so weak. Um, they're, they, they're so easily dismantled. 
but uh, for the sake of time, we're going to have to skim through them. I do talk about them in, in a lot of detail in my book, In Defense of Easter, Answering Critical Challenges of the Resurrection of Jesus. Uh, if you want more details on that, you can check that out. Um, but let's look at some of these other alternative theories that, that uh, more people have been promoting than the ones that we just kind of skipped, skimmed through. Um, you have the vision theory, which is also called the telegram or telegraph theory. Jesus just has the spiritual resurrection, so the body's apparently still in the tomb, and his spirit is up in heaven, and he, he sends his followers these really vivid visions of him that they're, they're so real that the disciples think that he's really alive again. But why was the tomb empty other than the linen cloths if, if it was just a spiritual resurrection? Do you see what I meant earlier when I said they can try to come up with a theory to explain how people saw him alive again, or they can try to explain how the tomb became empty, but they don't have anything that explains both. And so the vision theory and some of the other ones like it, like it, maybe it was just a dream or this one, which is actually the leading view among the critical scholars today, and it's known as the mass hallucin hallucination theory or just the hallucination theory. And this one, what it states is that, uh, you know, the disciples are so distraught. They were in such a grief-stricken state that they started to hallucinate these ideas that they saw Jesus alive again. Now, it is true that people who are really in a state of grief can hallucinate. This is something that does happen on occasion. Um, it's much more common with women who have lost a, a husband or something, elderly women who have lost a husband. Sometimes they will hallucinate that the husband is there talking to them. But hallucinations are often very wild as well. They don't make rational sense when you talk through these things. And there's no indication of hallucination at all when you're looking at this. I mean, Jesus is appearing to them on a roadway by the seashore or on a hillside or in a locked room. There, there's, there's no hint in any of these appearances that they're just hallucinating. What about doubting Thomas? Remember, he says, I'm not going to believe until I can put my hands in the nail scars. That's what he tells the rest of the disciples because they got to see Jesus on the day of the resurrection. That night, Thomas wasn't there. And so he said, I'm not going to believe till I see him. Well, eight days later, Jesus appears. And he's like, Thomas, go ahead. The Bible never even says that Thomas did touch. He just saw him and he said, my Lord and my God. Which, by the way, that is the correct response to Jesus Christ because that's who he is. What about James? Why would he be in a grief-stricken state that, that would induce some sort of hallucination? James was the half-brother of Jesus that we talked about earlier. If anything, when Jesus dies on the cross, he would say, yeah, but that's what he gets for his blasphemy. That's what he gets for going around claiming that he's the Messiah, that he's the Son of God. He's not going to be in a grief-stricken state over that. Yeah, he might be sad that his brother died, but at the same time, he would feel vindicated in not believing in him. And yet James converts what about the 500 people at once that saw him? You know, that would actually be, understand what I mean here, that would be a greater miracle than the resurrection itself. Why do I say that? Well, in, in one sense, because Jesus had already raised people from the dead. Nobody, there's no such thing as mass hallucination in terms of where everybody is hallucinating the same thing. So yeah, you can get a room full of 500 people and you can pump certain drugs in there and gases and you can get people to hallucinate, but they're not all going to hallucinate the same thing because everything's taking place here. It's all in their mind that's going on. And so for, to think that all of these people hallucinated at the same time would be a greater miracle than the resurrection itself in that sense. Because Jesus had already raised people from the dead. Remember Jairus' daughter, this 12-year-old girl who had passed away. And he gets there you know, because her father had come pleading for Jesus to come and help. And by the time he gets there, the little girl's dead. And he says, no, 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 she's just sleeping. And they, they mocked him. And he says, everybody go on out. And he goes in there and uh, with mother and father and, and with a couple of his disciples and said, little girl, get up. And she gets up. He walked into this town called Nain and they're carrying this young man out on, uh, you know, the pallbearers are carrying him out. And he walks up to touch the casket and says, young man, get up. And the young man gets up. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were one of the pallbearers, do you think you might want to listen to what Jesus has to say that day? And then he gets word that his friend Lazarus is sick. In John chapter 11, and Jesus waits. You know, he gets word, hey, Jesus, if you come, you can heal him. And he could. But Jesus waits a couple of days. And then he, he finally goes and they say, no, no, Lazarus. He tells his disciples uh, that they're going to go, to Le that Lazarus is sick. And they said, well, if we, that Lazarus is sleeping. They said, well, if we go, we can wake him. And he said, no, 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 Je he's, he's dead. 
but I'm glad for your sake because you're going to see the glory of God. He shows up and Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, come out to him one at a time and they're saying, Lord, if you had been here, our brother wouldn't have died. Then he tells them to roll away the stone. And he says, and when he does, one of the sisters says, but Lord, he's been dead for four days and he stinketh. That's how the King James puts it. Because he, four days, the body's decaying and everything. Don't, if you roll away the stone, that's going to be terrible. Jesus says, roll away the stone. Then he says, Lazarus, come forth. And then the man who had been dead came out of the tomb, bound hand and foot with a cloth wrapped around his head. And he was alive and well. In fact, several people, many people were believing in Jesus because of what happened with Lazarus. They saw, they knew that Lazarus had died and they saw him alive again, that many people were putting their faith in Jesus, that to the point where some of the chief priests were plotting to put Lazarus to death. The poor guy had just died and here they are trying to put him to death again because here's evidence that Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be. Jesus told the disciples, go ahead and touch me. You can see that I'm not a ghost. Luke 24, 39. The whole idea of a vision or dream or hallucination that being evident that this is what was really happening in the resurrection, is, it's nonsensical. Uh, in fact, think about this whole idea because they're not shared experiences. You can go to sleep tonight if you're married, you can go to sleep, you and your spouse can sleep and you can be dreaming about being in your favorite place. You can both have a dream where you're in your, in your favorite spot in the whole world. And you can even have a dream that you're talking to each other. But when you wake up in the morning, you can't say, hey, remember when we talked about this last night in our sleep? No, you can't do that because it was in each one of you had that in your own head. And it was a different conversation that was happening. But I think 500 people did that at once. Then there's the theory that say Jesus just faked his death. The swoon theory, you may have heard of this one before. In fact, it was popular in the 1800s up until the 1880s when it was really um, shot down by, by another liberal scholar uh, who said this just doesn't make any sense. So it says Jesus was just in a, when he went on the cross, he slipped into a coma-like state. He, he swooned. But what about the centurion at the cross? It's his job to make sure that people are dead. They were really good at their job. They knew what death looked like, what it sounded like, and sorry, but what it smelled like. They knew when somebody was dead. And they said Jesus had died. And then, just to make sure, they put the spear in his side. And John tells us something weird at that point, that blood and water flowed. Now, it's strange when we read that verse, but now modern medical examiners can look at that passage and say, you know what, we know for a fact Jesus is dead. Here's what Alexander Metherell said, a medical examiner. Even before he died... The hypovolemic shock, which means just a low blood volume um, because of all the beatings and everything, so the heart's got to pump faster to get blood to every area of the body. The hypovolemic shock would have caused a sustained rapid heart rate that would have contributed to heart failure, resulting in the collection of fluid in the membrane around the heart called a pericardial effusion, as well as around the lungs, which is called a pleural effusion. The spear apparently went through the right lung and into the heart. So when the spear was pulled out, some fluid, the pericardial effusion, and the pleural effusion came out. This would have the appearance of a clear fluid like water followed by a large volume of blood as the eyewitness John described in his gospel. John probably had no idea why he saw both blood and a clear fluid come out. Certainly that's not what an untrained person like him would have anticipated. Yet John's description is consistent with what modern medicine would expect to have happened. So modern medical experts can look at that and say, yeah, if somebody endured the beatings that Jesus endured and then they put the spirit, that's what would happen. And look at what John does in his gospel. Throughout John chapter 19, he's saying, he's describing the crucifixion and the, the, the trials and everything. Then he's just describing, here's what happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then the spear and this happened. Then look at what he says. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. And then this happened and then this happened. What is John doing in verse 35? It's almost like he's saying, okay, I know that sounded really, really weird, but that's what I saw. I was there and I'm telling you the truth. And we can look at that statement today and say, yeah, we know he was dead based on that. But think about this whole idea, the swoon theory. So Jesus slips into a coma-like state. He's not really dead on the cross. And then they put him into this, this cold and dark tomb. And 
Somehow he revives while he's there. And he's got to get out of the burial cloth. You know, they've got their wrists and the, and the ankles tied together. They've got to get that. He's got to get out of that. And then he's got to get to the, the door of the tomb. He can't crawl. He just had spikes driven through the wrist or through the hands. He can't walk at all. He just had spikes driven through his feet. At best, he could do some sort of military crawl. But imagine, I mean, he just had his whole front and back flogged, so ripped open and everything. Can you imagine how painful that would be? Then he's got to somehow roll away the stone from the inside by himself, if that's even possible in any way, shape, or form. And he's got to do that without the soldiers hearing it. Then he's got to sneak away, find the disciples, and say, he's, and by the way, he's just barely clinging to life, saying, I conquered death. No, every single one of them said, no, you're a fraud. And I'm not giving my life for you. But that's not how he appeared to them. He appeared to them in perfect health. And every one of them was willing to give their lives for him. So in the 1960s, this view was um, revived, pardon the pun, uh, by Hugh Schoenfeld in a best-selling book called The Passover Plot. It says that Jesus schemed the whole crucifixion and so he, was, he plotted with one or more of his disciples to give him this really powerful drug that would knock him out on the cross and everybody would think he was dead and then they would they'd put him in the tomb and the disciples would come and help let him out and then he would appear to people and say, look, I conquered death. But he didn't anticipate the spear wound. So he was only able to, able to live for a few more days and made a couple of appearances and then he died. And so this is what the Passover plot says in the book. Well, what about all the rest of the post-resurrection appearances? It doesn't explain those. And why would the disciples die for what they know to be a lie? And there are many other problems with this as well. But I want you to understand the type of people who write these books. I want you to see their mindset or the things that they say. Here's what he, Schoenfeld says in his book. The image of Jesus which emerges from this book does not, when honestly examined, detract from his greatness and uniqueness. Can you imagine... According to Hugh Schoenfeld, Jesus is a lying, scheming, manipulative fraud who tried to fake his own death and claim to be God. Or the Bible says he left the glories of heaven, he humbled himself and became one of us. God himself, the Son of God, becomes one of us and is born of a virgin in, very humble, in a very humble setting and he lives a sinless life. And then he goes and endures all sorts of torture including crucifixion, in our place. And then he rises from the dead and makes him, shows himself alive by many infallible proofs and then is raised to the right hand of God. That's what the Bible says about him or what Hugh Schoenfeld says, a lying, scheming, manipulative fraud. And Schoenfeld says, ah, it doesn't detract from his uniqueness and greatness at all. Are you kidding me? How delusional do you have to be to not just write that but to believe some of those things that he's saying? But again, people will believe anything about Jesus that is not what the Bible says about Jesus. They're looking for anything to get away from what Scripture really says about him. That is that he is Savior and Lord. So then there are other theories that have been proposed where people are really just grasping at straws. The women went to the wrong tomb. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, this was described in a book in the late 1880s by uh, Professor Kirsop Lake. Uh, it hasn't really caught on. You can see why. Uh, the disciples went, or I'm sorry, the women went to the wrong tomb that morning. And you can sort of understand that part because they leave while it's still dark. And by the time they get there, the sun had risen. Uh, yeah, that was meant to have a double meaning. The S-U-N had risen, and yes, the S-O-N had risen as well. Um, but, so they go to the wrong tomb, and nobody's there, so they think, wow, he must have risen. They go and tell everybody. Okay, but what about everybody else? When they go back and check it out, I mean, did, did they continue to go to the wrong tomb? Did Joseph of Arimathea, the guy who owned the tomb, did he forget where his tomb was? I mean, he could have checked it out. What about the Jewish authorities? Did they forget and why did they promote a different view? Did the Roman soldiers guard the wrong tomb? And what about the angels? Did they go to the wrong tomb as well? Why were there angels in the wrong tomb? And what about all the post-resurrection appearances? Or what about the burial cloths? Did somebody else rise from the dead that day? You can see why this is one of my favorite alternative theories. It just doesn't make any sense. But people are willing to believe anything other than the truth about who Jesus is. Or some people say that he, they, the disciples conjured him up during some sort of seance. And so this, if you can imagine, some sort of phantasm or some sort of ectoplasmic goo, if you think Ghostbusters and slime or something like that. Um, and somehow they mistook that for a physical bodily resurrection. And yet there's no mention of any of this kind of thing going on. And Jesus appears to them when they're not even expecting him. 
And why would the disciples who were devout Jews knowingly violate the law given in Deuteronomy 18, which forbid, expressly forbid any attempted communication with the dead? And how would that ever be mistaken for, for a resurrection? And there's a bunch of other less common theories in addition to the seance theory. The annihilation theory, which says Jesus' body just dissipated into gases in the tomb. Oh, that's a beautiful idea, really. I mean, try proving that one in court. Where's your evidence? I don't have any, but it must have been that because I don't like the alternative. And that'll get thrown out immediately. So your whole argument, there's absolutely no evidence for at all. Or some people say, no, he's the world's first time traveler. So he was on the cross and then, be, you know, they were able to zap him out of there and heal him. Uh, or here's what it really is. It comes down to an anti-Christian bias. They don't want it to be true because if Jesus rose from the dead, and he did, then who is he? He's the son of God. He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And he is going to return someday and judge this world in righteousness. And that's exactly who he is. But let's take a look at the last group of, of arguments here, the last group of ideas, and that's that somebody moved the body. Now, or that, that the body was buried in a different way than what we read about in the Gospels. So there's the whole idea that grave robbers stole the bodies. But grave robbers, again, they don't steal bodies. They stole the valuables buried with the bodies. Or the reburial idea. This is from a document known as Toledot Yezu, uh, which is from the 8th century, but they believe it goes back to as early as the 4th century. And here's what it says, that there was the gardener there, because the tomb was at a garden, remember? And um, the, the gardener's name is Judah. He overheard the disciples plotting to steal the body. So before they could get there and, and do it, he moved the body to a different place and sold it to the Jewish authorities for, I bet you guess, can't guess how much money. You're probably thinking 30 pieces of silver right now because every time I ask that question, somebody gets it. Yeah, because that's exactly what it says. Where do you think they get that from? From the Bible. And then the Jewish authorities allegedly dragged the body through the streets and everybody knew that Jesus had died. And so when the disciples go around just a few days later proclaiming that he rose from the dead, and on the day of Pentecost, seven weeks later, when they said, you know, Jesus rose from the dead, every one of the people in that crowd could have said, uh, no, we just saw his body dragged through the streets. What are you talking about? Well, none of that happened. And the, even the Jewish authorities reject that view. It puts them in a very bad light. And it's not the view that they've been promoting for hundreds of years. John Dominic Crossan of the Jesus Seminar said that dogs and, and maybe other, birds, or other animals like, like crows or other birds have, had eaten the body. He says this, By Easter Sunday morning, those who cared did not know where it was, talking about the body of Jesus, and those who knew did not care. Why should even the soldiers themselves remember the death and disposal of a nobody? I hope that statement offended you because it is offensive when you talk that way about Jesus Christ. But I've got a question for John Dominic Crossan, one of the, the leading members of the Jesus Seminar. Why have you spent your entire adult career trying to disprove the resurrection of a nobody? You see, John Dominic Crossan knows that Jesus is not a nobody. In fact, Jesus is the most influential person that has ever lived. By far, there's not anybody even close to that. And yet, you get statements like this. Pray for this guy, for John Dominic Crossan. Uh, because, you know, one of the co-founders of the Jesus Seminar, Marcus Borg, passed away a few years ago. It's too late for him. He knows beyond any shadow of a doubt now that Jesus rose from the dead. But it's too late. But it's not too late for people like John Dominic Crossan. Pray for him that they would bow the knee humbly before Christ before it's too late. But you know what? Let's look at this argument. So the whole idea is an argument from silence. There's no ancient writing that says Jesus is just buried in a shallow grave, which is his idea. He says Jesus, he was, a common, he was crucified as a common criminal. Whether he was guilty or not, that's a different matter. But he was just, he, that, that's what happened to crucifixion victims. They didn't get an honorable burial. They were just thrown in this common grave and the body would decay, it would be eaten, that kind of thing. But it contradicts their own historical method, their own historiography, how you, how you write science, how you record, or history, how you record it. And that is, if you have early multiple sources that are reliable that speak about something, well, then that's probably what happened. Well, guess what? All four Gospels report that Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. So you have early reliable sources telling us what happened. And he just says, nope, I'm not believing that. I don't want that one. So I'll come up with something else, even though that contradicts my own methodology. And it also contradicts Roman and ancient Roman and Jewish laws. For example, the Roman law says the bodies of those who are condemned to death should not be refused their relatives and should be given to whoever requests them for the purpose, purpose of burial. That's Roman law. 
How about Old Testament law? If a man has committed a sin deserving of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land. For he who is hanged is accursed by God. And this is what a lot of the disciples must have been wondering at that point. Jesus was hung on a tree, on a cross. Is he really being cursed by God? Well, think of what Isaiah 53 says, that it prophesied that we considered him smitten by God. Yeah, that's exactly what people would have been thinking, that if, if he's being crucified, then God's cursing him. No, actually, he's being crucified as part of God's plan to redeem us. He's laying all of the sin of the world on his son, who's taking our sin so that we can be forgiven. But then, what about Jewish practice at that time? Well, Josephus tells us just a little bit later, the Jews are so careful about burial rites that even malefactors who had been sentenced to be crucified are taken down and buried before sunset. All of these line up perfectly with what the Bible says. So you have the Roman law, Jewish law, Jewish practice. You have the biblical accounts, and John Dominic Cross says, I don't care about any of that. He was eaten by wild animals. That's not history. That's make-believe. And the Jewish authorities promoted a different view. And here it is. This is the one that you read about in Scripture, Matthew 27. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Notice what they just said. They recognized that he had prophesied he was going to rise from the dead three days later. So they're admitting that he had predicted his own resurrection. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Well, the question comes up here when Pilate says you have a guard. Was he saying, you have your own guard, do it yourself? Or was he saying, here you go, you have a guard, go do it. The word there is the Greek word kustodia, and it refers to a watch or a sentry. Many people believe it could have been anywhere from four to 16 different soldiers there. But Roman or temple guards? Well, actually, the Bible tells us what they were if you continue reading. Matthew 28. This is after Jesus had risen from the dead, after the angel rolled away the stone, after the soldiers shook like dead men is what it says. Now, while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. There's the argument. His disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. Remember that. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. Which one were they, Roman soldiers or temple guard? It's pretty clear they were Roman soldiers, because if they were just temple guards, would they care if the governor heard about it? No. If they were Roman soldiers, would they care? Yeah. What was the penalty for Roman soldiers who fell asleep on the job during their night duties? It was death. Actually, the way they would do it, according to Polybius, is that they would line up their entire company of soldiers into like this tunnel that you would have to run through, and as you ran through, they would beat you to death with cudgels. And if anybody ever happened to survive that, then they were forbidden to be... There was, nobody was permitted to ever help them, assist them in any way. They couldn't go into any of the towns or villages. Look... Roman soldiers didn't fall asleep on the job. But then it goes on in the Bible, it tells, so they took the money and did as they were instructed, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day, when Matthew wrote, had written his gospel that was commonly reported among the Jews. In fact, it was commonly reported in the 2nd century, in the 3rd century, in the 4th century, because we have early church fathers who were on record debating with Jewish authorities who were saying, no, the disciples stole the body. That argument was still being used. But there is a huge problem with this view. I don't know if you caught it when I went through it. The disciples came at night and stole the body while we slept. Did you catch it? The disciples came and stole the body while we slept. How could sleeping soldiers know who stole the body if their eyes were shut? You see, every single argument that is raised against the knowledge of God will do exactly this. It will crumble. It will fall. Because the word of man cannot stand, but the word of God stands forever. And so anytime people try to come up with ideas that contradict God's word, those will always fail. And that's what people have been trying to do for 2,000 years to try to explain away the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why? Because if he rose from the dead, and he did, then that means we have to answer to him. And someday, everyone will be before him. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. So what now? What do we do with this information? Take a look at the list. Here's all those alternative theories. 
And it's not like I'm holding back on their toughest ones, like I don't know how to answer them or something. like. No, they, they're all there. And we talked about, well, there's one that we didn't talk about, sorry, on the right side there. Aliens stole the body. Um, I've seen that as well. <laughs> if that's what you have to resort to, well, somehow that's more believable than the person who's more influential than any other person in human history by far. There's not, not even a close second the person who was predicted throughout all of these Old Testament prophecies, who fulfilled these prophecies in detail and to the letter. And the person that skeptics are so concerned about and spend so much time trying to disprove his existence or trying to disprove certain things about him. They, they, in fact, it seems sometimes skeptics are more worried about Jesus and more concerned about Jesus than a lot of Christians are. Why? Why? Well, because I think deep down we know this is exactly right. And I think deep down a lot of skeptics know it's true as well. They're trying, to, they're trying to persuade themselves that it's not, so they're willing to believe anything other than the truth on this matter. But here's my question to you. If you're an unbeliever, if you have not given your life to the Lord, take a look at the list. Pick one. Which one do you want? Actually, you don't need one. You need two. You need one that explains how they saw him alive again. You need one that explains the empty tomb. And when you add those two really, really, really weak views together, it doesn't make a stronger case. It makes it a lot weaker. Because now you're depending on two extremely weak views. And that's what you're, that's what you're hoping for as far as eternity. You're hoping that Jesus really isn't the way that should in life. And yet we have looked at some of the evidence today for the resurrection, and we can go into much more detail on that. And it's been called the most well-proven event in ancient history for a reason. But, you know, Jesus didn't talk about, he didn't just say that I'm the way. I mean, he did say that in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that is such an offensive statement in our culture today. How dare you say that you're the only way? But Oprah Winfrey says that. It's, it's impossible. Jesus can't be the only way. That is one of the most offensive things you could say in our culture today because you've got to respect everybody's beliefs. Yeah, you can have respect for other people's beliefs. It doesn't mean that you have to treat them as valid. It doesn't mean that they're true or equally true. You can still have respect for that person. But they're, they're saying that, that's impossible. There's no way he can be the only way. He didn't just make that claim. He proved it. How? Remember what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it's at all possible, let this cup pass from me. Jesus knew what was about to happen. He knew he was going to be arrested just a short time from then. He knew he was going to be put on a bunch of trials and that he would be beaten, that he would be spit upon, that he would be mocked. He knew that he would be flogged. He knew that he was going to be crucified. And he also was fully man and he didn't want to endure that. He didn't want to go through with it. And that's completely understandable. None of us would ever want to go through that. And yet, what did he say shortly after this? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He still went to the cross. What was he praying? Lord, if it's possible, if we can save sinners another way, then please let's do it another way. And yet, did he still go to the cross? Yes. What does that mean? That there is no other way for man to be saved except through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. It doesn't matter how good you might be as a Hindu or as a Buddhist or as a Muslim or, or Mormon or whatever belief system you have, you cannot be redeemed except through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, except by faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Because if you could be saved in another way, then Jesus did not need to die on the cross. And yet, he did. God didn't spare his own son. When Paul was preaching in Athens, he ended his message with this, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. What is proof that the gospel message is true? Christ's resurrection from the dead. Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then what Jesus said to Lazarus' sister says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. My question for you is the same question Jesus asked her. Do you believe this? Are you placing your faith 
in the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. If you are, you can have absolute confidence that one day he will raise you from the dead as well. And you'll spend eternity with him where there is no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death, no more curse. But if you're rejecting him and you continue in that rebellion, the Bible says that you will be judged according to your works and you will be paying the penalty for your sins for all eternity. You'll be separated from God for eternity in what's called the lake of fire. And I don't want that for you. I don't want that for anybody. And the solution is to bow your knee to Christ. Humble yourself and call out to him to forgive you. And put your faith in the one who died on the cross for your sins and then rose from the dead. And that's Jesus Christ. And if you are a believer, what are you doing to tell others about him? Let's be busy serving our Lord out of gratitude for what he's done. Well, I could go on and on talking about the resurrection. I love this subject, um, but it's, we do need to bring things to a close. Let me, um, let me pray, and then I want to tell you about a few of the resources that we have here available for, at Answers in Genesis. So let's, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that he was willing to become one of us, to live a sinless life, to show us how we are supposed to live, to, to not just show us the way to be, but to actually be the way. And that's who he is. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, thank you that he was willing to undergo the, the most agonizing torment that we could ever dish out. And he did that not because of his own sin, because he was sinless. He did it for us. He did it so that we can be forgiven, so that we don't have to die for our sins, but Lord, we can have, our, we can have his righteousness applied to our account, that we can be completely forgiven so that when you see us, you actually see his righteousness. And then, Lord, thank you for raising from the dead three days later, showing that you have power over the grave, power over death, and giving us the hope and the guarantee of eternal life for all who believe in him. Father, we pray these things. I pray that, that those who do not know you as Savior, that those who have not humbled themselves and not bowed the knee before you, Lord, that they would... Think about the things we talked about. They would, they would think through who Jesus really is and what their objections are. Why do they object to him? What is it in their heart that's holding them back from trusting you? Father, I pray that you would work in their lives and in their minds and in their hearts. Soften those things, Lord, to, to the truth of your word and the gospel message. Father, we pray these things in the name of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So I mentioned a few resources we have during this time. Um, if, if you're watching this as it's airing, this is uh, Resurrection Sunday. And unfortunately, the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter, have been shut down because of the COVID-19 virus. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to reopen soon. Uh, but we've got some freebies for you. We've got AnswersInsider.com. This is our monthly newsletter that you can uh, sign up for. So go there, and it's a free newsletter. You get some of the latest um, news about the ministry. We've been running Facebook Live programs throughout this entire time, uh, for, at, every day from at 10 a.m., 12 p.m., uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 7 o'clock at night. You can uh, see a lot of the behind-the-scenes footage, some of the other speakers that are, are giving presentations. And during this time, if you're in a position that you can help us as a ministry, uh, because many of us are, are uh, thankfully, many of us are still able to, to be working at this time. Uh, we have that privilege, but uh, without the Ark and the museum being open, uh, a lot of the revenue that normally comes into the ministry is not coming in. So if you're in a position where you're able to help us out and give, uh, please visit answersingenesis.org slash give and, and uh, help us out if, you're, if, if the Lord lays your, that on your heart. Uh, if you want to see this presentation or one very similar to it, uh, this is available on DVD called He is Risen casting down challenges to the resurrection of Jesus. Or if you want to go into a lot more detail about the resurrection, uh, I did a, a series with my friend Eric Hovind several, a few years back called Risen Without a Doubt. And it's actually a 12-session study on six DVDs going through the events from the triumphal entry through the, uh, to the arrest, through the trials, and the crucifixion, and then the resurrection. So in much more detail about all these events. Uh, there's a study guide that will walk you through uh, those things as well. Uh, the book that I mentioned earlier, In Defense of Easter, Answering Critical Challenges to the Resurrection of Jesus. Uh, just had such a, a wonderful time 
of researching and writing this book. Every single day that I was working on it, I got to study the resurrection of Jesus. So it's something I loved doing. Uh, we've got a, a chapter on the resurrection in uh, this book, How Do We Know the Bible is True? The first volume deals with that. Uh, some of the issues that I, I mentioned in this talk and also in uh, my talk that uh, you may have watched yesterday on the modern myths about Jesus uh, are covered in both of these volumes. If you want to know more about what we do as a ministry, a lot of the, the questions that we get on a regular basis about creation, evolution, uh, the age of the earth, the, was there ever really a, a global flood, all of those kind of things that we get on a regular basis are covered in detail in, these, in what's call, called the Answers Book series. Uh, there are four of them now. Each of them deal with 25 to 35 of the most commonly asked questions. Great resources to have, so, so uh, you can pick those up. We've got a, a series of books that I've put together uh, with a buddy of mine. I wanted to take the information that we teach here at the Creation Museum at the Ark Encounter and actually in this presentation that you, may, that you just heard. Uh, actually, a lot of that information is presented in the second book in this series. This is an action-adventure series for young people. It's called The Truth Chronicles. Uh, it's illustrated with this manga style of art. And uh, so it's for youth, it's youth fiction, so it's um, like junior high, middle school age. I've had a lot of fun with that, and they're a lot of fun for adults too. Uh, there's a study guide that goes through 15 of these issues in much more detail. So a lot of the uh, things that we address as a ministry are actually woven into the story. Uh, it's a time travel adventure, uh, so you get to see dinosaurs and all sorts of other things as well. And uh, I mentioned uh, in defense of Easter before, we've got... Um, uh, some specials here. We've got a, t right now we're offering $10 off and free shipping any order of $49 or more. You have to use this coupon code SAVE10 uh, at, when, at checkout there. And we also have our uh, educational classes, our creation apologetics classes on sale right now. Uh, there are six different classes uh, from, all, from several different scientific disciplines, astronomy and, and creation apologetics in general, geology, and um, several others. Our, all six courses normally would be almost $300 value, but we're offering all six of them for only $19 right now. Uh, go to AnswersEducation.com for more details. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, God bless.